It's a very cold, rainy morning here in Lagos, Nigeria. And we wonder what the weather is like wherever you are. But we thank you very much for joining us this morning on Breakfast Central. Hopefully, we'll have stories to warm you up and get you set for the day. I am Olive Emodi. And I am Osaogi Ogbawan. It's a, a quick reminder to everyone to not trust uh, the weather uh, predictions, the weather forecast, you know, that your iPhone tells you because it didn't say anything about rain this morning. I definitely not about this, you know, the level of rain and, you know, how heavy it was this morning. And how we had to swim to morning. our cars. Yeah. Swim out of our cars, swim with our cars. It gave zero warnings because I did look at the, you know, the weather conditions for the rest of the week and it showed that it was going to be somewhere, you know, 30 to 34 degrees centigrade all through the week. Um, didn't tell, say anything about rain, you know, and so well, this morning was really, really shocking. Don't blame iPhone. Maybe you should blame climate change and global warming well, and maybe. the fact that a lot of things are changing. So typically, all things being equal, there shouldn't have been rain. But with climate change and the effects of climate there, change, there, I mean, rain are setting. Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Anyway, uh, good morning. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the next two hours, as always. We have, you know, some of the biggest conversations happening here in Nigeria in news and current affairs. And we hope that you can also be a part of the conversations this morning via social media handles at New Central TV or when the phone lines are available. You can also join the conversation. There's so much um, on our plates today. Of course, Nigeria and uh, other countries in, uh, uh, on the uh, continent have got, come together to set up an anti-terrorism summit. And of course, that took place yesterday. It's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today. But on the side, I did have a conversation yesterday with one of our guests. And one of the things that I brought forward, you know, was the fact that Nigeria's um, economy, you know, had been currently, is currently ranked fourth on the continent. And it made you, you know, as a Nigerian, remember back in 2013, 2014, when there was the rebasing of our GDP. And Nigeria, of course, took over as the first and uh, number one economy on the continent with predictions that it was going to hit a trillion dollars um, in about 10 years. I remember in 2014, 2015, Nigeria was one of the countries to look forward to, amongst others, you know, uh, um, according to a CNN report. That was in 2014. But um, eight, nine years down the line, we are currently fourth with a GDP that is somewhere around 253 or 254 billion dollars, which, you know, many could argue um, shows how much, you know, regression, you know, that has happened to our economy. Um, arguably also due to bad governance um, and bad governance um, policies. And, you know, obviously, the, you know, the fact that the country has not actually been able to grow its economy in the last eight years, and in fact, in the last nine years. Um, I'm not sure who else to blame, if not bad governance. Of course it is bad governance. It's the people at the helm of affairs. Although, yes, they would say that the government is made up of the people, and it is the people who make their way into government. Not only am I concerned about the current situation, but also what the projections of the future are. Because if in the past eight, nine years, ten years, we haven't seen as much progress, we've seen some level measure of regression, what is the guarantee that we're going to see the actual desired change yeah. and the actual growth that we need in the coming years? What is there? I mean, I, I, how, can we, how can we not be sure or how can we guarantee that in the nearest future we'll not look back at these days and wish that we had this time back? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really scary thought. It is. It is. You know, but I mean, this is the, you know, I mean, if you're going to talk, talk about a result sheet, of the last eight years of the the, the Buhari administration, this really is what it is. Um, we're currently behind South Africa, Algeria, and Egypt. And just like Ibrahim Oshino would try to argue yesterday, even if I didn't get the point of his argument, that they these are countries that have much smaller population. Um, and so I was wondering what he meant, you know, or what his point was. You know, if they have much smaller populations, then why are their economies bigger than ours? If we're talking about 200 million people here and the strength of our economy and, you know, what we should be able to pull together, you know, as a country. But um, the, the hope really is that the current administration understands how far we've fallen and understands what must be done to pick us up again. Um, the challenges that we have are multidimensional. And, of course, you know, they include bad government policies, um, terrorism, corruption, you know, which, of course, is still a major problem here in Nigeria. And if these things aren't tackled, you know, we, we almost would not see significant growth in Nigeria's economy in, in the near future. And we, don't have any, we don't really have any excuses, you know, why we shouldn't be able to. And I'm hoping that the current administration also understands that you don't have to do everything. And I think I've said this a couple of weeks ago. You don't have to do everything. 
No one, Nigerians are not expecting a miracle in the next four years, all right? Let's say you have four years and you lose the election in 2027. Um, you don't have to, you can't fix everything in four years. But can we at least lay certain foundations? So can we, in the time that we have, put certain things in place to ensure that we see some level of growth that inspires the average Nigerian to once again believe that we're moving in the right direction? And this, of course, is inclusive. You know, I keep calling that the Minister of, of Power because, you know, he is the one that every... I mean, it's, it's, it's a point that everybody can... They've, they've can, actually challenged him. Yes. They said I've, that, I've seen that on Okoye has done 60 hours, that he should give us 60 hours on interrupted power supply. I would absolutely love and that. that would be amazing. But we don't have the infrastructure to do it. So even if you call, ask him to do it and, and you know, demand that we have 60 hours of... Nigeria currently doesn't have the infrastructure to pass 60 hours of electricity across the country. So All that's right. not even going to happen. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm rambling so much. <laughs> because we, uh, we unfortunately we cannot bring you the news this morning so we have a little more time to to share our thoughts um but the point is you know power would always be one of the most important things you know that i would always point at that this is something that don't do everything all right you obviously can't do everything but let's fix power if any government like i did say this yesterday i said it before and i'm going to say it again that any government that can come into Nigeria and fix our power problem is a government that will not need to campaign for votes in the next election because Nigerians will happily vote that government back into power, knowing that power has been one of the biggest challenges we've had as a nation. The, uh, the, the power problems we have have affected our uh, foreign investments, have affected small and medium-scale businesses, have affected the quality of life of the average Nigerian. Today on the show, much later when we're looking at what Nigerians are saying, we're going to be looking at fuel scarcity as, as one of the topics because it's resurfacing in Nigeria. And there's a tweet that I'm going to take. It's by a guy called Mafe Jok. I mean, his handle is Mafe Jok Mami. And I could completely relate. He went on a, a total ramble talking about how he's not able to function because of the heat, how he's sweating, how he's not able to think. He's not able to be creative. He cannot work. He cannot work out. Yeah. And it just, it just feels like a waste of time. And in all honesty, there are a number of young Nigerians who will leave this country because of our power problem? Yep. Not because of anything else, but yep. because the power problem doesn't allow them to be their best at work. They're not getting the best quality of sleep. They're not able to deliver. Very true. Right? So, yes, I completely agree with you that if we can fix our power problems, there'll be some, it will be a ray of hope to Very Nigerians. True. And then, also talking about uh, this current administration always keeps saying, oh, we're fighting for corruption, it's fighting us back. Corruption is a problem that we need to, we need to deal with. We, we, we've come to the realization that corruption is a challenge. But, it, it hurts me to think that we've accepted corruption as part of the Nigerian system. And even outside Nigeria, we've seen that they've used that brush to paint Nigerians, such that when you travel and you're at the airport, you can see the way that you're being treated because you're carrying a Nigerian passport in the West. You're, even not, you don't even have to go to the West, even some Arab nations. The way that they would treat you because you're carrying a Nigerian passport, because there's just an assumption that you're a corrupt person. Yeah. And that's not the reality of you know, every Nigerian. So we need to be able to deal with that. There's a lot of work we need to do with cleaning our image. But before we clean our image, we actually need to do the internal work. And it's not just at the governmental level. It's also on the individual level. Because it is the individuals that are criticizing government today that will, become, that will be at the seat of power tomorrow. And what happens when they get there? Everybody has this mentality of, oh, as long as me and my family are okay. Uh, this, like you always say, this administration will work for me and my family. Yeah. Everybody's just thinking of how they can go there, liberate themselves, liberate their family members. And they're out. So let's come back to the very basics. The basics of, even from our, our schools, our primary schools, our secondary schools, at that foundational level, being able to teach them morals and values, teaching them the value of hard work, teaching them the importance of delayed gratification. Because we are just this generation that wants everything done and wants everything done now. Yeah, so, it's but I think it's, it's... It's difficult, you know, because, you know, if, if you look across, you know, the country, what examples do they see every exactly. day? Exactly. You know? so we don't have... You can I mean, teach as some. much as you can, you know, but what, what are the examples that they come face to face with every day? Um, in reaction to something that you said, I saw a video, I did see a video on X uh, a couple of days ago. It was meant to be a skit, a skit where um, a couple of guys were reenacting what it feels like being in a hostel, you know, in, in, in Nigerian university, where someone, you know, has rice, the other person has gas, then the other person does the dishes, you know, but, you know, so I have rice, I want to make rice, cook rice. And then a friend of mine comes in or a classmate comes in and says, oh, you know, I'll eat one. Then you say, oh, then you're going to have to go do the dishes. Or this person says, oh, I have gas. You know, so basically that division struggle of and division of labor because <laughs> of hunger, basically. And a reaction to it, you know, was funny 
but it was true, which was someone said, there's almost, it's almost impossible for anybody living under these type of conditions to invent the next Tesla or, yeah, you know, you're Facebook. You're thinking of how to get food. Or, exactly. Because that is the, the conditions that those people are living under is, first of all, there's no electricity. There's barely any food to eat. The environment, the, the bathrooms where they go to, you know, on, on campus are dirty and filthy. That's not the environment that anybody is going to be comfortable enough to say, okay, I want to invent something, you know, for the next generation. And, and it, it, it's, it's basically painted a picture of how much our lack of the most basic things derails us as a people. I know what's even worse. It's not just that they're suffering this. You know the way that um, they say mystery loves company. We're not only putting people in the poverty of the body and of the, of the stomach, there's also the poverty of the mind. So they're not able to dream past a certain level. And what now happens is when some of them get into positions of power and influence, they're telling you, I suffered, so you too must suffer. You, it's what we see in a number yeah. of universities where lecturers are saying, A is for God, B is for my wife. In my time, nobody ever achieved this. So you too, you wouldn't achieve this. Yeah. So we're perpetrating a cycle of trauma, a cycle of poverty, not just of the body, but of the mind. It's yeah. a long way we have to go. There's a lot of work that we have to do. But as is our custom here, we will keep talking about these things, keep challenging us to think of ways in which we can improve and better our country and our communities, even in the smallest units. Let's share with you what our top stories this morning are on Breakfast Central. Tinubu 6 counter-terrorism hub in Africa is one of the top stories we're looking at this morning on the show. And also lawmakers hold national dialogue on state policing. Uh, yes, several reactions have come up from that. We'll look at these reactions and the IGP differs with governors on state policing. That's of course one of the reactions against it. Very surprising. Also this morning, long petrol queues resurface in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja. Interestingly, it's all around the nation in some parts as well. We'll look at that much later. And we'll bring you the newspaper front pages where you can call in. These and more on Breakfast Central. Fuel queues have resurfaced in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, as there is a current business boom for black market sellers. A new central television visited some petrol stations within the capital where some drivers expressed frustration over their inability to buy petrol. Marvelous Obomanu tells us more. This is not the first time the nation's capital is witnessing long fuel queues. In 2024, there have been reported cases of residents spending long hours to get fuel, either for lack of the product or hoarding the product by independent marketers subsequent to a price increment. As Nigerians struggle to get the premium motor spirit, black market sellers are using the opportunity to make a kill by increasing the price of the product. Okay, 15 liters, how much? Here at Total Police Station, you can see how some Nigerians are struggling just to get the product. Some of them say it is a shame that a rich oil producing country like Nigeria, yet they are still seeing pockets of PQ here and there. Some of them say they'll spend three to four hours just to get the premium motor spirit, and that this has also affected their business activity of the day. I was here early hours this morning. So I saw a very long queue. So I don't know, most, almost 90% of quest stations in the of Abuja, they are all shut down. So I've been here now for the past three hours. Same all over. The, most of the police stations are not on. You can see like uh, the ones who are opposite uh, MMPC towers. Mm -hmm. Even, there are plenty of queues here. Come, come to this place now, the same thing. And then if you can see now, we are moving around to see if you can get from Yalon and it's very difficult. I'm suspecting maybe there was going to be a slight uh, price adjustment. Because aside that, I don't see any other reason why that should be. <laughs> Some of them express frustration over their inability to get the product and wonder why a country rich in oil is still facing such challenges. It's a bad moment to us as a nation and as a citizen, as an oil producing uh, nation. Queuing for a poor, I should, I should label it a taboo to so Nigeria as a country. And it's a shame 
how can Nigeria be an oil producing nation? The gold subsidy is still out, and we are still going to do it. It, 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 it's alarming. Although the cost of the fee kill is still unknown, adding the price increment to the hardship being faced by citizens further increases their burden. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Obomman. Thank you very much, Marvelous, for that uh, update. What we're seeing is that the fuel scarcity and the fuel queues are resurfacing, resurfacing not just in Abuja, but in different parts of the nation. As we look at when we see what Nigerians are saying, there was an update regarding the fuel scarcity in the uh, Akwai Bomb State. There was an update about fuel scarcity. Even people have talked about fuel scarcity in Oshobo. Uh, it just feels like every other day, one state or the other is uh, having a case of fuel scarcity. And what, what is really uncomfortable about this is the fact that Nigerians have to pay an exorbitant fee compared to what we used to pay. We have to pay a lot, a lot more for fuel. So paying a lot more and then not having access to products, it's really just a case of double jeopardy. Um, I agree. The FCT, unfortunately, I think has suffered the, the most petrol scarcity um, in a while. There's a time, there's a time I think it was sometime last year or two years Lagos ago that had. they had like a... No, 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 I'm not comparing. Um, I'm saying like they've had like one time where they had like six months straight of petrol scarcity. Um, after 2022 or 2023, it was, just, it was just on for the longest time. Even when Lagos had petrol, the FCT just had like, you know, unexplainable petrol scarcity for a long time. So I feel bad for them. You know, every time that I hear that, you know, they're back to experiencing it again. And they had really, really long petrol queues. Um, but yes, you know, I agree with everybody who, you know, commented on that report, you know, that it's a shame. Um, it's unexplainable. Nobody really can tell exactly the reason why there's petrol scarcity. It's not, I mean, if you ask all the petrol, atten um, the petrol station owners, ask, you know, the Minister for Petroleum Resources, nobody will give you a perfect reason why there's petrol scarcity. They will probably just say it's hoarding, you know, uh, petrol marketers that are hoarding petrol. Petrol marketers have their own reason why there might be petrol scarcity. It's just the NNPC might have its own reason why there's petrol scarcity, but nothing really just makes, you know, any sense. And like you said, Nigerians are currently paying the highest that they've ever paid for petrol in, in Nigeria's history. The highest they've ever had to, you know, pay for there petrol. There are people that are paying seven fifty for petrol yes. in Nigeria. People and are still paying cannot and get still it. Can't get the Pretty much the same thing with the electricity. When we're talking about paying two hundred and twenty-five naira per, um, per kilowatt, and still, you know, you still wouldn't get the electricity. So I mean, so what then is the use of increasing the prices of these things? The claim of ending subsidy has still not been proven to be entirely true. That we truly have ended subsidy. And, you know, we're no longer paying, uh, Nigeria's no longer paying subsidy. I, I mean, there's still reports. Um, I think it was a uh, former Kaduna State Governor, Nase Arufai, who made that statement last week, that Nigeria is paying even more now for subsidy than we were paying before the president declared that subsidy was over. Yeah. So make it make sense that we are paying more for subsidy now. Petrol is the highest that it has ever been in Nigeria's history, and yet you still experience petrol scarcities. We've not been able to, you know, you can't beat our chest and argue that we've been able to fix any refineries in the last 10 years. We've not been able to get ourselves to at least locally produce to some extent in the last 10 years. The dependency on the Dangote refinery, I do not also think it's sustainable. It's a private business, and I don't think that that's what a nation should be relying on, that, oh, very soon the Dangote refinery is going to come into, um, um, uh, be fully functional, and we're able to get petrol there. That's, that's not what anybody should, should, should rely on. No. Um, Will we hear from the Minister of Petroleum, the Minister of Petroleum? Not very likely. Are we going to hear from the NNPC? Not very likely. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's the thing that is, you know, maybe one of the challenges here. The fact that these persons who hold these positions do not believe that they owe Nigerians a proper explanation when there are these moments, when Nigerians are dealing with, you know, a crisis like this. They, they do not feel the need to you know, be answerable to Nigerians and explain why we are paying 600 naira per litre of petrol and we still can't get it to buy. It's a very sad situation and uh, we can only hope for the best in Nigeria. Whilst we keep, to keep talking about these, we can only hope for the best and the government needs to put itself in the shoes of the citizens because that's the way that Nigerian citizens feel like. The government feels very far. They do not feel the pulse of the citizens because they're not directly affected by all of this. But we'll talk about this some more. Let's move on to our next story. Our next piece is a very sad and heartbreaking one. An ex-user 
is calling for justice for a female student of the British International School Abuja who was seen in a viral video being bullied by schoolmates. In an SOS post on Monday night, accompanied by two videos, she stated that she needed the message to go viral and uh, for justice to be gotten for the victim. The victim was seen being slapped repeatedly by another female student while asking, who broke my heart? Now, I must warn you that this video you're about to see is very disturbing. Blood, but very disturbing. Let's take a look. Have put her relationship. And he died. Ah, look, what's the What's the boy's name? What's the boy's name? What's the boy's name? <sighs> now that video was very disturbing very troubling uh on many levels one the the fact that they were bold and courageous enough to hit another human it, it makes me question a lot of things it makes me question what the structure and the system of the school is like such that uh they feel that they're able to be to bully another student maybe feeling like they can get away with it I'm also worried about the kind of background that these children come from, the bullies especially, uh, wondering how, how they were raised, like how, how they, they think that it's okay to hit another child. And this is going to be a very triggering video for a lot of people who have been victims of bullying as children. A number of us have friends or have had experiences where in our, in our younger days we're bullied. These are the ones that will grow up and get into office and realize that they have become bullies they, because they don't, they don't understand you know, what it is for people to be treated fairly and for, what, for people to be treated with kindness. I, I, I'm, just, I'm very shocked on all levels, Osauge. Yeah, I'm trying to just confirm the victim's name. I think I did see it earlier, but you know, just to also um, be clear, um, yeah, her name is uh, Miriam, Miriam Hassan, yes. Uh, but just to also be clear, a lead, city, a lead British, uh, I think that's the name of the, of the school, has put out a statement. I uh, saw it a few minutes ago uh, saying that they are investigating. Um, it is not um, what the school is known for. Um, they are currently investigating and they would like, you know, that anybody please come forward with more information as to what exactly has happened, you know, there. Um, um, I, saw, I saw the statement this morning. We'll probably will share with you before we, uh, the, we end the program this morning. Um, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily, I mean, as shocking as it would be, um, almost every Nigerian secondary school has bits and pieces of these things happen. It is that very early stage of puberty and adolescence and, you know, you know, you can sense that, you know, in those small spaces, the characters like you mentioned, you know, of being poorly trained at home will start to show themselves. Um, I grew up in an environment where even from secondary school, there was already the conversations of joining, you know, a cult. Even from, you know, SS1, you know, or second, secondary school one yes. or two, there were those conversations already, you know. So it's not, it's not entirely strange, you know, to hear or to see these types of things. And bear in mind, in, in Lagos here, without calling names, we've seen one or two cases where a, a child passed in a school here in Lagos. The, the parents of the child accused um, or, you know, alleged, you know, that the child passed, you know, because of bullying that they were receiving in school. And so these things happen. Um, what we are not sure of is how much more work the school itself is putting in to ensure that every child feels safe. Because you will see animals around you as classmates. These are wild animals. That's the only way that they, they feel good. You know, it's like seniority. Oh, senior, senior this and senior that. Once you get into SS2, you want to bully those in SS1. Once you're in SS3, you want to bully those all the way down to the, to the bottom. GS1. If I in GS3, so you want to bully those in GS1. It's a part of the things that, you know, you would experience as a young Nigerian. And it's not just here in Nigeria. It's across the whole world. But here's the thing. What 
more work do schools need to do to let children feel safer? If you're being bullied in school, are you certain that if you speak with your, I didn't say, I didn't go to a boarding school, so I don't know the names of those, of the, you know, miss, the, the, the people, guidance counselors. Guy, exactly, exactly, I don't know those things. Um, um, but for those in boarding schools, are you certain that if you speak with your guidance counselor or your hall prefect or whoever it is, that you will get the, you know, protection that you seek? Um, because if, if, we, if we were certain that every school in Nigeria had those types of policies, made sure that they put in enough training for their teachers and for their, for their guardians in school to protect every child, it would, it would very likely reduce it to some extent. I agree with you. Know, you. It's not like the bullies will not be there, but if you're being bullied, you're a victim, you have somebody that you can report to and punitive measures will be taken almost, in fact, immediately. What we are seeing in that video is enough for a child to be expelled <laughs> exactly. from and not just, without And I'm glad that you said that. Not just a regular punitive measures. You said the child deserves to be expelled, and I, I completely agree with you. Not the one of telling the child, okay, come and apologize to her, say sorry, two of you, okay, hug, and the matter is over. No, no. We need strong measures. People, students need to understand that if you do this, you will not be accepted in school again. You yeah. will go back home, I'm... and your parents would have to you know, dance to the tune of the music you've played. I just feel like Nigerian schools need to do better. I agree. And it's not saying that they are not trying at all, but within that community, that secondary school community, the, the school itself needs to do better in protecting children. Absolutely. From these, I mean, from themselves, yes. basically. And also need to model what, a, a, what discipline without bullying looks like. Because a number of these students replicate what they see. And I'm not saying that's the case in this particular instance. I'm saying this because I went to a boarding school and a number of us went through the system where if something happened, your teacher, there was a teacher we called Jezebel, and I'm sure I've mentioned this on air before, they will come into the class and they will flog you with cane on your back. Anyhow, like, there, there was, we we're almost treated like animals. So the way that they would discipline us, it's passing a message that this is right. When you, when, yeah. you, when you misbehave, this is how you should be disciplined. So it's not a surprise when a senior student then decides to punish another student in that way because that's what they have seen as normal and as yeah. regular. So we need to redefine what discipline means to us from the teachers, the principals, and create a safe environment for our schools. But more importantly, we do hope that investigation is carried out and that justice for Miriam is In another made. society, you probably will hear that the sue is... Uh, the school the is being sued. The school is... Not this, yeah, the school, the, is the parents sued. of the bully. The exactly, everybody. Yes. Everybody gets a lawsuit, you know. <laughs> Anyway, anyway um, let's move on from that uh, to another story. Following up on the announcement made by President Bola Tinubu at the Africa High Level Counterterrorism Meeting in Abuja, a regional counterterrorism center is set to be established. The center will act as a focal point for intelligence exchange, operational synchronization, and capacity building across the continent. Speaking during the conference on Monday in Abuja, the president underlined the importance of tackling the core roots of the problem, poverty, injustice, and social justice in order to tackle terrorism comprehensively. The president uh, emphasized again how crucial it is to cut off the financial conduits that support terrorist activities, including payments for ransom and illicit mining activities. Those who think illegal mining has no connection with the financing of terrorism are surely mistaken. The international community has both the moral and legal obligation to help in this cause because it is outside money, not African money, that fueled the illegal operations. We shall be knocking on the door, on this door of the international community to answer the call for justice, peace, and fair play. Key to our collective efforts against terrorism is the need for a fully operational regional counterterrorism center. This center will serve as a hub for intelligence sharing, operational coordination, and capacity building throughout our region. Additionally, we must strengthen existing counterterrorism structures, such as the Regional Intelligence Fusion Unit, RIFU, Abuja, the African Center for Study and Research on Terrorism, 
and in Ogier, and the Committee of Intelligence and Security Services of Africa in Addis Ababa. All of these bodies must work. Joining us now on Breakfast Central is Dr. Ndubwisi Christian Ani, Senior Researcher and Project Coordinator at the Institute for Security Studies. Good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning and thank you for coming. All right, uh, talk to us about your thoughts on the Africa Counterterrorism Summit and the possibility of its success. Now, there are some people who uh, would disagree about disagree with the idea because uh, they say that this is something that has been floated around for the longest time and uh, they worry about the success of it this time. So talk to us about your thoughts on the summit and the, the body, the Africa Counterterrorism uh, success. Yeah, um, so I, I think it's good to start from the fact that we've seen that terrorism has been touted as the cause of coup in three countries already, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And these countries have decided to excise themselves from the um, ECOWAS Commission. So this is bringing a worrying trend for, especially for Nigeria, that is supposed to be a regional hegemon um, within Africa. Um, and then now this is happening within its backyard. So I think Nigeria finds it very useful then to now advocate for this counterterrorism unit because the threat of terrorism will spread, as in, as in it's not alarmist um, challenge, but then it will spread because of the way it has been handled. It's been handled in a balkanized way that, you know, only coalitions, different coalitions of the willing are coming together to, um, you know, to address terrorism. But it's not a regional, it's not a caucus issue, it's not just a coalition issue, it's a continental problem um, that we are seeing. So when we look at, for instance, the G5 Sahel force that was propped by France, um, now it's already defunct, um, the member states have already uh, left. Um, you have the Accra Initiative, um, having the coastal countries that are involved in the operations. Now what we have seen that um, that Accra initiative is yet to become really vibrant. You know, there are different pockets. The African Union um, agreed to establish the, a special force within the African standby force uh, dynamics to um, address uh, terrorism. But this will be mainly, you know, a combative stance against terrorism. But this has not been established as well. So when you look at the dynamics, um, his call for a regional coordination center is very, you know, it, it's very welcome um, within the continent um, and it's, it, it's laudable. But then the challenge will then be, you know, how then do they bring, coordinate all the ideas, all the experiences, all the issues and information about how terrorists operate and how they can be um, tackled effectively. You know, oh. when will the center be established in the first place? Because it will also still take a very long time to debate at the African Union level uh, yeah. for this. All right. Um, I would like that we speak, you know, about the Nigerian, um, you know, aspect of it in a bit. But before that, you know, now you've brought about the different regions and uh, um, different setups, you know, that are available in, in you know, parts of the continent in combating terrorism and the challenges. In Francophone um, Africa, in you know East Africa, in you know West Africa, here, um, every one has their own individual terrorism issues. Um, but there is also foreign influences that I, I I would like that you speak about. The influences from 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 the West, the influences from I mean Russia, of course, you know, which is is taking steps into the continent bit by bit, um, and of course maybe also from Asia. How do you think that the continent can have a united voice against terrorism when we have influences and sponsors of you know, our security architecture from parts of the, of the world that don't agree with each other? Yeah, I think you have it um, you know, well spot on uh, because at the end of the day, the coordination center will still need to be propped up by um, regional or, you know, there will still be a request for funding from these um, key actors. But then uh, when you see the real issue, uh, and I think it's good for us to get back to it, that the key issues that have caused the um, challenges that we're facing and the issues of terrorism, actually, is about external interferences. 
you know, when we look at the situation in Mali, as in there's been um, for years campaigned by the um, uh, 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 by the rebel group, um, conversing against um, external interferences that have been trying to prop up the government um, to the disadvantage of the people in the north, um, you, you know, so that in some ways kind of contributed to that whole um, uh, saga. But then now you also see a new situation where in Mali, um, still on that same case study, um, Russia is now coming with a very much more combative uh, position, um, reacting to the security requests from the Mali government. But then the challenge then is that, you know, the, its combative stance will it last without addressing the root causes um, of those challenges that we have. So they are the root. And then when you talk about then the illicit economies aspect of it, you know, or the, you know, the funding aspect of um, terrorist groups, while they are not doing it directly, you know, but then they kind of, uh, um, you know, benefit from the proceeds, foreign actors benefit from the proceeds from illicit activities. So let me use um, uh, some instances. Gold mining, um, you find it across, you know, the Sahel region. Uh, timber logging, you find it across the Sahel region, you know. And then where are these, um, let's say the timber logs, um, if you use, for instance, the coastal uh, logs, which are endangered species, where are they headed to? They're headed to China. And where some of those logs are being cut are from, you know, from a very, um, from the place that are controlled by armed groups, um, you know, whether it be the um, Jenin Akelda affiliates or the um, ISIS group. So when you look at that dynamics, you, you begin to think that, you know, why are we not thinking through how to stop from the root causes, from the things that are fueling or providing financial resources to these armed groups? So you're spot on in terms of looking at the foreign dimension to it, but then definitely a lot of change has to happen on the ground in terms of our governance system because we are in, we in the first place led them to come in in the first place uh, uh, so we can't we can't always be crying foul when we are the ones that um allowed that what what is what is it about african agency that african actors cannot stand up together to fund their missions to secure, um, you know, good deals with the foreign actors, that gives them a centralized agency that we do not still have to run back to say, oh, foreign actors um, are intervening when we ourselves are not, you know, reacting effectively. All right. How do you uh, perceive that this might uh, impact us? Now, let's look at it as a country. Let's bring it back to Nigeria. How do you perceive that this will, in a way, affect us positively? and negatively we don't seem to have had a we don't have a handle yet on our issues or our struggles with terrorism so how well do you see this maybe benefiting us and what are the challenges you see that it will uh, cause us as a nation yeah in terms of that regional coordination center well what, what to as, as i mentioned earlier on uh, first of all there has to be a debate at the level of the african union um, about that um, terrorism center you know, there has to be also an agreement of who will host that center itself. It's a proposal at this stage, who will host it? And you remember there are other centers already um, that are available there. So when, if Nigeria then proposed that it will host this center, um, then it means that it will be established within Nigeria. Um, but then when supported at the level of the African Union, we have to be mindful that the, the Nigeria is one of the biggest supporters of um, the African Union and pays all, most of the dues. So, well, not most of that, and together with other five countries. Um, so it's very important to note that then Nigeria will do all it takes to then uh, prop up this center, which is the Regional Coordination Center, and to have it flowing. Um, and have it um, established. So the cost there is just in the logistics and then in the establishment. But then it bears a lot of fruit for the region, if only it's being uh, used. Because you have to understand that um, even within Nigeria, you know, there is a challenge of information sharing um, within different by different actors. So when you come to whether it's the police or the military sharing information, and then now you're talking about a whole, not even just West Africa, you are talking about a continent wide, you know, where information sharing has been a challenge uh, for, 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 uh, for decades, 
you know, people, um, different units, um, police units, or whether security law enforcement agencies don't talk to each other. I've been in a, in countless meetings where all the law enforcement agencies don't even know themselves. They don't even speak to each other. They don't have direct links. You know, it takes ages for them to to initiate communication. So, how will this information sharing uh, 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 um, take place? So, that is the key thing that. Has to we have the we also have Afripol that is the African Police um, uh, Intelligence uh, uh, Network in Africa. But then, you know, where is the information sharing from those from those units? You know, it, it doesn't happen. So for me, one other fear is that it will just be one of those um, centers that are then established yeah. and then you know not doing anything substantive on the ground Very true. to help. You know, people. And you know, I mean, it, it, it's probably also important to look at the, the the core, you know, reasons behind some of these, you know, like you just mentioned AFRICOM. Um, you know, I, I always just have that fear that there's more to some of these security setups and security ag agreements than just simply, you know, protecting the African people from terrorism. Um, you know, so, and so those may, may be some of the things that would derail progress in that regard. Um, like you said earlier, people benefit from the presence of these terror groups on the continent. And if you, you know, don't tackle some of all of that, you might be wasting your time. That's been conversations in Nigeria. The National Security Advisor, Nuhul Ibadu, you know, made mention yesterday also at the summit that you know, Nigeria's, you know, death uh, reports, you know, have reduced from 2,600 a month to about 200, you know, people a month. Is that something to celebrate? Are we, you know, can we look at that and say, we are actually making a lot of progress with the fight against terrorism in Nigeria. As in, um, arguably, as in, there are different ways of seeing it. Um, first of all, yes, as in, there has been a significant pro progress in terms of shrinking the territorial space of these um, extremist groups um, for the past uh, few years. Um, but then, you know, when we look at what is happening now, you see a diffusion, you know, a more a fragmentation of uh, the security threats that are now, you know, not then only within uh, the 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 um, you know the northern um, east eastern northern area within Borno region. You know, it has also uh, you know gone down. You know, now we are seeing terrorist um, collusion with uh, whether it's bandits or different actors. You know, uh, taking place whether it's in southwest, southeast, um, and even close to Abuja uh, in, in Kogi State, there are accounts of um, um, terrorist cells um, operating within that uh, region. So, in, in many ways, yes, as in you know that has also diminished. But when you see the aggregate of fatal uh, fatalities, or maybe when you think of it beyond the uh, what is being attributed solely as um, jihadis or terrorist um, inter, um, attacks, you know, we can look at it, um, you know, that it has reduced significantly. But when we look at other uh, spiral out of, um, of, of the situation, you know, we see that Nigeria is facing a huge threat that some of these actors that are op that operated within that scene, you know, have brought back those kind of um, um, inter um, attack mentality down to this both to the southern and even uh, threatening the capital as well. So, yes, I think it's a huge achievement that, uh, you know, not to underplay that achievement. It's a huge achievement for the nation on its own. But, you know, what are we doing to look at the spill-out effects um, of terrorism, you know, across the country, you know, that which will become much more worse if, you know, we have a lot of economic downturn and then also the law enforcement are not able to um, you know, uh, follow intelligence and get some of those actors that are now, you know, uh, spreading terrorism all across the country. Okay. Right. Um, one of the things in, in talking about the reduction of the deaths, one of the things that was made reference to was the fact that uh, the access to weapons is now more expensive than before. For example, uh, the example that was given was how an AK-47 that previously would cost 500 about 500,000 are now cost about 5 million, meaning that there is um, lack of access and availability to these weapons. But we cannot downplay the fact that our borders are porous. And that's, from there, we see an influx of these weapons coming into the country. So let's talk about the role that the customs has to play in the fight against terrorism. 
a uh, few weeks ago, uh, Fisai, or a Nigerian journalist, did a report on how we see an influx or how easy it was for him to import rice, the number of bags of rice. And he said in his words, maybe not the exact words, but what he said is you can bring in anything into the country as long as you can pay the right price. So what is the role that the Nigerian customs has to play in ensuring that we, nip, we, we, we win this fight against terrorism, we reduce the influx uh, of, of uh, weapons into our country? Yeah. Um, thank you. It's a, a, I think it's a fundamental question that you ask. Um, and, you know, when we, um, in our research on, uh, uh, or in our engagement on organized crime um, situation, you know, the critical element of, of what is happening in terrorism and also um, organized crime threats is the role of state embedded actors, you know, in, in this. Um, and you can look at it from different ways. And then, first of all, you think about what is the, let's not have that whole discussion about minimum wage. We, we can also, we, we can have that uh, at a later point. We can also have a, a discussion about, you know, to what extent are these actors paid? When we talk of the custom agents, um, how is their job security? To what extent do they receive um, um, assurances and allowances that um, enable them and not to um, engage in, in in this kind of vices or in corrupt acts, you know, it, those are things that we need to consider. You know, when we are thinking of why, what should they do in the fight? You know, we have to look at what are some of the intrinsic, he, talk, he spoke about root causes. Now let's go back to the root causes, you know. The root causes for corruption and accepting of bribes is that people do not have the option or stability or do not have the confidence that the government or the, their employees are paying them well or value them. So that has to come from that stage that, you know, when a custom officer or um, receives um, or it, it comes in contact with, consign, um, with goods, how does it then, you know, um, act, um, act around it? Does it then, you know, act in due diligence to investigate and look at all the items um, in it, or does it just accept the small amount of money that then that will come to it? And that will be of, um, of help to him, you know, close to him right now and right there, not thinking about the broader ramification of it. Those weapons that he allowed to get into the countries in the first place could be then used um, in an attack that affects him or his relations. So that mentality change has to uh, change. And it comes from, you know, when we think of uh, in Nigeria as a whole, you know, that uh, poor governance or corruption or bribery affects us, in, affects everyone, you know. So the custom has a key role to play um, because the poorest, but when we are talking about that arms and ammunitions have reached, uh, f um, have reached a, a, a higher rate, that's not nothing to celebrate about because you know arms easily get to Nigeria, whether it's from Niger, um, coming from Mali, or coming from different um, areas. So uh, what we are talking about is is just you know the um, the official rates uh, that that we are thinking about it, or some of the rates that have been considered in terms of um, when, when doing this research, or even also yeah. against the the dollar and naira um, differences. Yeah, so I was, I was I going think, to mention that. I was gonna, you know, mention that, you know, that it could be because of the, you know, Naira's uh, uh, exchange rate, and you know, of course, the value of the Naira. That's why it's that expensive. Um, but yeah. there's obviously a lot of work, you know, that needs to be done, you know. And I, I think, you know, to a large extent, you know, Nigerians are tired of hearing, you know, words and, and talk. Nigerians want to see that there's actually a difference, you know, and, and in proper investment in security, you know, not just, you know, press statements. Proper investment in, in security infrastructure across the country. And drones want to be certain that if you are kidnapped, you know, you will be rescued. You will get response from security agencies, at least, you know, to some extent. And these are some of the things that are important, that parts of northern Nigeria that, you know, weren't able to farm or have not been able to go to farm for the last, you know, five, six years, will be able to go back to their farms. And, of course, in the middle belt, these are the things that are important. You know, every other thing is irrelevant. All right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much Just for to... stopping by. Uh, we, of course, would like to speak with you again as uh, soon as possible. Wish you a great week yeah. ahead. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move away from talking security now. A dialogue meeting on, while well, still talking security on state policing, in the 10th National Assembly started the process of amending the 1999 Nigerian Constitution in the sixth round.
The Office of the Speaker of the House of Representatives organized a dialogue which marks the start of discussions on Bill 2023, Establishment of uh, State Police, which is a bill sponsored by 13 other House of uh, House Representatives and Deputy Speaker Benjamin Kalu that would alter the federal government, uh, or the federal government of Nigeria's constitution. The bill is designed to improve sec public safety and boost law enforcement in Nigeria by decentralizing the police. The proposal in the bill provides for the state police alongside the federal police and outlines a constitutional framework for states that choose to establish and maintain their guests. Uh, there have been arguments for and against the state police. Uh, we, we did see that the IGP, through his representative, showed reason why the state, why Nigeria is not, in his words, mature for state police and stating that there isn't adequate infrastructure to the police, uh, there isn't adequate personnel, and that there isn't um, uh, adequate, there isn't adequate personnel, there isn't um, adequate uh, 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 funding for the police sector. You know, so there are some other concerns and how the governors can manipulate this for their use. Uh, these were some of the concerns that was being raised. And some of the suggestions that were being made was that the FRSC and the NSCDC be made uh, bodies under the Nigerian police force. There have been arguments for and against state police and uh, moving this from the area of the exclusive list to the concurrent list. Uh, so some other arguments against it would be that if you look at the, the concurrent list and some of the issues that are in there, for example, um, health care or, or education, some people would say that uh, the challenges that we have as a nation can be tra traced down to state problems because even these ones that are within the purview of the state haven't been adequately attended to. But we'll find out what your thoughts are regarding state police for, uh, against. Do you think Nigeria is mature for it? Do you think that it's time that we have it? Of course, our former president, President Goodluck Ibele Jonathan, is of the opinion that Nigeria is certainly ready for it. Um, sometime no. in February, I think it was on the 15th of February, now we did see that uh, uh, the President Bola Tinubu's administration, of course, we've seen his support. President uh, Bola Tinubu has been in support of state police. The House of Representatives, of course, have reviewed the bill to, um, to establish state police. But the IGP then come in to say that we're not right for it. He does have a point. He does, he, he have, does a have a point. You know, and you know, I think that these are some of the things that we probably need to look at when they are making these constitutional amendments. A little details here and there. You know, federal police, of course, will still exist, uh, you know, along with the state, state police. police. And so they will be able to step in into situations where state police may not be adequate. The fears that a lot of people have really is the misuse of these uh, state police officers but the by is, the governor. Are the state police what, officers not already? They are already, the federal they police already officers are. Not, they exactly, already so are. what we're, we're afraid of is already happening. Yes, I agree. Um, but I also don't even think that's a good enough excuse, you know, for people, citizens to not have, you know, security. But we're talking about better security for Nigerian citizens. Don't tell Nigerians that, oh, the government will misuse it so we cannot give you security. It doesn't make any sense. That they will misuse them during the elections exactly. as well. Yeah. They're already misusing them now. Exactly. So, you know, these are details that they would have to fine-tune, um, um, you know, with, with that constitutional amendment. I would, I would like to see where it goes. Um, with these conversations. It's a good thing that they're also having these conversations. Just before we have a quick recap of some of the things we've spoken about in the last hour, we shared a story earlier from um, a school in the Federal Capital Territory, uh, Lead British International School, I believe. They have put out a statement, like I said earlier, and we'd like to share with you what their statement reads. Um, it says, of course, you know, the Lead British International School, Abuja, is deeply concerned about the recent incident of bullying that has come to light and wants to ensure our school community and public that we're taking this matter very seriously. We're committed to providing a safe and supportive learning environment for all our students. Hence, upon learning of the incident, which we initiated the process of uh, reaching out to the victim and family with a view to providing support, including access to counseling services to help them cope with the emotional and psychological impact of the incident. It goes all the way down, you know, to say that um, we have um, taken immediate, uh, we have immediately initiated an investigation appointed a dedicated team to conduct a thorough inquiry into the matter. Lead British Inter International School Abuja, established in 2007, is a renowned education brand with a proud history of producing thousands of alumni who continue to make the institution proud. We want to reassure the school community and the public that we are taking all necessary steps to address the isolated incident and prevent a reoccurrence. We are committed to fostering a culture of kindness, respect and empathy at the school where every student feels safe, valued and respected. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this was important at this time, you know, and so we're hoping that there would be um, proper investigation and punitive measures, you know, to be taken.
Um, nobody wants, you know, another situation where, you know, parents um, cannot, you know, fight and defend their child because, well, the other parent is richer. N nobody wants to see that, you know, nonsense play out again. Um, and so, you know, we would, we would follow up on this one and see where it I'm leads. Curious on definitely who making the, the rounds across. One of them, definitely. Like, <laughs> karma. I'm really glad he filmed it. Because oh, yeah. You know, other things that have been filmed lately. I saw a video yesterday of a, a lecturer at um, one of uh, yeah, the Yeah, a married lecturer. Yeah. In fact, there are two different them. ones. Yeah, I saw The married yesterday. lecturer with another married woman. Yeah. Then the lecturer with another student. Yeah. Oh, dear Lord. Anyway, we'll talk <laughs> more about these, but let's share with you a recap of the conversations we've had this morning. Tinobo 6, counter-terrorism hub in Africa. We've explored what this would look like and how this would impact us as a nation. Lawmakers hold national dialogue on state policing. We've looked at some of the uh, perks for and the arguments for and against. And we've also talked about the long fuel queues that have resurfaced in Abuja. There are more queues in other parts of the nation and we'll touch on them when we look at what Nigerians are saying. But now let's bring you what's coming up next. Coming up next, uh, the IGP differs with governors on state policing. We did speak a little bit about that. And of course, what Nigerians are saying. We'll be sharing with you the views of Nigerians on social media. We also will be bringing you newspaper front pages. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. Let's go through the papers this morning and just to share with you that you can be a part of the papers that we're viewing this morning. All you need to do is to call the numbers that will be showing on your TV screen as well as tweet at New Central TV on all platforms. Uh, we'll be looking at the papers this morning and let's begin with our first newspaper for today. Uh, on the front page of our first uh, paper that we're looking at this morning is this Nigeria newspaper. Nigeria not ripe for state police. IGP Egbetoku shoots down Klamo. That's the big story. Ex-President Jonathan says, let's stop the debate. It's long overdue. We also have still on the front page, we'll, recon we'll consider implications from multiple perspectives, says Tinumbu. And then, IPOB warns Southeast landlords on discrimination against indigents from other states. Police arrest one suspect as kidnappers killed Babcock University professor. I saw this yesterday. That was a very sad one. Um, we'll come back to that. Naira abuse. Go after treasury looters as well. Expert urges federal government. A valid, valid, valid one. Reverse Assembly overrides Ubarra passes local government amendment bill into law. Uh, we'll still talk more about this story uh, regarding the the state police and how Nigeria may or may not be right for state police. Uh, there are some who criticize President Good Luck Billy Jonathan that he was not able to effect this in his time as president and why is he speaking about it now? And, um, and you know, the, the, the response to that is if he couldn't do it then and he thinks it's a very important thing, is it not even all the more reason why he should speak about it now as something that he couldn't fulfill in his time in office? But if you would like to know your thoughts on the state police, is this something that uh, you think that Nigeria should explore? Please let us know what your thoughts are. Uh, call the numbers that we will be showing on your TV screen. Yeah. And then, uh, you want to speak about that? Yeah, I wanted to say, you know, that it's an indictment on them when they say, I mean, so, so both parties are, are, you know, correct. The IGP saying that, you know, we're not necessarily ripe for it because, you know, there's certain things that need to be put in place is true. Uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan says it's long overdue. It's also true. Um, and of course, you know, there's a stronger argument that, you know, these are things that should have been done in constitutional amendment long ago. But it's an indictment on them when they argue that the reason they do not want state governments, uh, state governors in, um, in control of their own police um, um, agencies and police forces is because of misuse. What they are saying is that they know themselves. And they know that within themselves they don't respect Nigeria's constitution, neither do they respect state constitutions, neither would they respect the laws of, you know, governing their states. They know. They, they are aware that once they become governors, they see themselves as, as, as emperors. They are aware that, you know, the Nigerian constitution, Nigerian state has not been able to rein in, you know, um, politicians who break the law. They are aware that they've had a president who didn't respect court orders. <laughs> they are aware that there are governors who also don't respect court orders. You know, I mean, when they tell a governor that, you know, th th there's a court order saying this property should not be demolished, you know, until, you know, court proceedings or whatever are over. 
and it still goes ahead to demolish it. Let's not they even, are aware. Let's not even go too far. Was it not a few days ago that we talked about Yaya Bello? Exactly. Did he not have police uh, security exactly. detail attached to him? Exactly. When there was an order that he be, you know, arrested, the FCC was coming to arrest him, and those ones helped him to escape. And a governor came and picked him up, you know, a, a sitting governor, came and picked and up someone who... Came whisked him away. Exactly. <laughs> like Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, they are aware, and that's why it's an indictment on themselves, because they know themselves very well that they do not respect the, the laws of the land. And so even if you create the constitution, you know, that would handle or, of course, would be able to um, put the, the structure for state police in, in, into, um, um, into motion, they themselves know that they may not respect that structure or they may completely. not respect those laws. Those yeah. state laws. They know that they are state houses of assembly themselves cannot control them if they decide to misuse the police officers that they, they've been taking, uh, put under, under their watch. Absolutely. So, so there's so, many details. And so, I'm sorry, just to yeah, chip in also. Ahead. Funding for state police also. I remember when they talked about the independence of the judiciary on a federal level and on the state level, that you know, um, um, state governors used to withhold funds that were meant to be you know, for the judiciary at the state level because they wanted them to always be loyal to them. It's also going to be a problem, you know, for state police. And so these are some of the things that I believe they should, you know, fine-tune. And the good thing, you know, it's important that these conversations are had. Someone says you cannot throw away the baby and the bathwater. You can't say that because this uh, policy is fraught with challenges that it will not be implemented if implementing the policy will be for the greater good of Nigeria. So now let's start to highlight what the challenges are and then start to create measures to check with these challenges. Section 214 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, as amended, provides for policing as we have it. So if that is going to be amended, it's even going to be a long journey. It's not something that is going to be done in two weeks, right? It's something yeah. that will take a long process. So whilst that long journey is ongoing, we now have to start thinking of measures to put to checkmate the powers of the executive at the state level to ensure that yeah. these people do not abuse this. Uh, another argument is, I mean, I, I did say this earlier, why some people think that it's, it's, um, it's not a necessarily a foolproof method to combat insecurity in Nigeria is because they say that if you look at all the other uh, sectors that are within the concurrent list, the ones that the state governments have the power to you know, decide over, that they've come to ruin the number of them because uh, the states have not apportioned as much uh, uh, effort and time into ensuring that these sectors succeed. I agree. You know? So that is also another argument that many people have proffered and used. I said, look, education, health, these ones, they're in, in the concurrent list. Nothing has been done. They've come to ruins in the different states. So what is the guarantee that it would do this on the state level, that it will be any different? Very uh, true. So, so it's important that whilst we're looking at these challenges, that we think about every likely possible negative situation and then start to look for ways in which, because we've tried for the longest time. What we have for the longest time hasn't worked. So maybe it's, try, it's time to try something else, because they said our insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a change. In the same breath, you're looking at, I mean, those who are arguing for state policing. You can't be saying that something is happening within Lagos, and then you're expecting that someone who is a, who's a police officer and whose terrain from, is from, from, from Abuja, yes, or, or Benue, or you know, some other states, comes to sort out the issues. Within the state, if there is a state police, you understand the workings of the state. The same way that we have these thugs. Thugs have found a way to put systems and structures in their operations. There's the, there's the Agboro that governs certain parts of you know, Lagos. So even as a bus driver, you already know when you're getting here, you're paying this ticket to this person. This. They have organized themselves in that way. I agree. So I don't, I don't necessarily agree that federal, you know, the federal structure for police would still not have worked. I feel like it was also mismanaged. Well, let's let's speak with Chidi. I'm All going right. to chip in my thoughts. Good morning, Chidi. Hello, Chidi. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Please go ahead with your comments. Yeah, um, my take is on the uh, state police. I, I disagree on that state police. I disagree because that's not the way forward for state police. Because if you look at what will help Nigeria, is that, okay, instead of you doing state police, why not recruit those numbers of persons that you're supposed to recruit for state police? and trust every citizen that you will go back to your own state. Every police officer that is from Kano to go back to Kano State because they know not people from Kano State will leave Kano State to come to Lagos. People from Bruno will leave Bruno to go to Akwaibo. It doesn't work that way. There is no need of this state police. What we should do is, okay, we recruit more hands, but everybody should stay in their own state. 
to govern their own state. Because somebody in Akwabu knows Akwabu very well. You cannot take somebody from Akwabu to go to uh, Inugu, to go and uh, staff in Inugu. It's not possible. So if you say state police right now, you are really not telling the politicians that, oh, they have grounds now to do whatsoever they like because they know this voice and they'll be working for them. Even when we don't have the state police, they are using talk. Those talks will be state police tomorrow and nobody can do anything with those things. That is my take. So the federal government should look well into this affair and uh, take a good decision for Nigerians. God bless Nigeria. Good morning. Comment. Um, I can see the sense in what he's saying. The only risk there is that I'm sure that there are states that don't have, you know, sufficient representation of uh, police officers, or are there is there a certain quota? I'm, I'm not very well aware of this, but I don't know if there's a fixed quota that we can say, oh, from Delta State we have these number of police officers, from Kano State we have these number of police officers. Uh, there might be a risk to the applicability of that, but I can see the sense in what he's saying. Well, I mean, within themselves, you know, when they have these deliberations, these things will come up, and I'm sure that they will be able to, you know, um, create the best format, you know, with which state policing would work. Um, I was going to say something earlier, I've just totally forgotten it now, but I, I, I wanted to also mention that I also feel it is completely selfish that when there's an argument of state policing, the, the people who should matter most, the Nigerian citizens who should matter most, are not being considered. What we are thinking about is governors will misuse them. Like, we have one governor, all right, and then we have a state that has 11 million people that need better policing, that need better security, that need, you know, better security infrastructure policing them. And so the argument to deny these 11 million people the better security architecture and better policing, better police funding, the argument to deny them is that one person here would misuse them, which I feel is very, very selfish because we've not, been, we've not gotten to prioritize the citizens themselves that need a better policing you know, structure and better policing infrastructure, better policing, police, police funding. Until we prioritize those ones, you know, we, we continue to have this argument about how this governor is so is you know has high temper and is going to misuse the, the police uh, to their temperament, like we heard yesterday, um, and is going to misuse <laughs> misuse the police force. But the the, the point is, um, citizens should be prioritized, and if we prioritize the citizens, they will know that 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 singular reason is not enough to deny millions of people the policing that they should have. But must also, we must also mention that the conversation about funding the police is something that should be brought to the front burner because there's not enough funding for the police as is. There's not enough personnel. There's also not enough... Uh, uh, I mean, if you speak to the average police officer, a number of them complain about not having adequate welfare. I remember speaking to a police officer sometime I, last see, year. See, listen, I, I'm sorry, I jumped. I agree. Yeah. Like, like you said, it's the same death in infrastructure that's happened to healthcare on the state level, happened to education on the state level, happened to, you know, even basic infrastructure on the state level. That's the same thing that we'll see in police. Mm. I totally agree that that's very, very likely what will happen. We would not suddenly start to see state governors now decide that they're going to give all their funding, you know, all the funding that they should give to the police. It's not, it's not going to happen. There's also that. And so, we would, it seems, already sounds like we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot. Because you realize that some states fund their police better than other states. You'd realize that, you know, um, 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 certain states, you know, police have better infrastructure than, you know, that's, which is normal. But these are the little details here and there that, once again, you know, need to be... State House of Assembly and the weaknesses of State House of Assembly are also a problem. All right. We have uh, Abdul Karim calling from Lauren. Good morning, Abdul Karim. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please go ahead with your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, with due respect to the commentator, that uh, we are not privatizing the interest of the populace at the expense of one good person. Please get it corrected. People experience terrorism under these individuals that you talk about. They use talks to terrorize, and this is a general view, and this is this can, be, this can be attested to, and that's why the populace compromise, uh, uh, and that is why the populace is trying to even compromise or mortgage their priorities to check, to checkmate 
this government. Don't let us deceive ourselves. And don't let us live on theory. Let us be realistic. Our politicians are not mature. We experience terrorism. There are no oppositions. What we have are the terrorized people. By the time the opposition is completely silent, then anarchy takes over. And I'm sure you know what that leads to. Without the state police, they take advantage of the talks to terrorize and silence opposition. This is not a theory. This is what we live with on a daily basis. And when you hear the governors too, they say they want to do exactly that the federal government does with the commissioner of police in their state. They believe that the president has the power to terrorize the governor using the chief security officer of the state, that's the commissioner of police. They want to do the same. Maybe we should allow ourselves to mature over time or get our people more civilized or educated. Where Abdul Karim. people will be more interested in governance and what it takes to govern. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. He does have, you know, really good point, you know, which is what, you know, that's the idea that has been painted that they will be misused by governors. And like he said, the governors are already using thugs to terrorize, you know, um, um, citizens. Imagine when they now have a whole police force to themselves. Under their control. I agree with that. But I personally don't think, because like I said before, it's an indictment on the system and society that we, you know, we're living in. It's an indictment that because they themselves know that they will misuse these things. And that's why they keep pointing the fingers at each other and saying governors will misuse um, police force. It's an indictment on state houses of assembly also and how completely useless they are. 36 states of the of Federation, all the State Houses of Assembly, completely useless with regards to the interests of the people, and of course, checkmates in the executive. And so these are this, the, the different levels where it is, it is difficult to defend the you know, entrusted uh, police in the, in, the, in the state governor's hands. And I, 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 have to, I agree with him, but I still don't think it's enough. I feel like, you know, we should still be able to fine-tune these things and get them working. Okay. Oh, Let's right. move over to the next paper, which is the Daily Trust. All right. The Daily Trust, while still talking to uh, police, IGP kicks as Jonathan and others canvass state police. Uh, Abdul Salami Akbabio warn against politicians' influence. Current policing system ineffective, says Abbas. I'm committed to reform, says uh, President Tinubu. Also, Ondo APC primaries, three aspirants appeal against Aida Tiwa's victory. Um, what to know about, of course, the new First Bank acting CEO, court vacates order affirming Gandhi's suspension. Uh, terrorism, renew social contract with citizens, UN tells Nigeria and others. Um, remember, you could also please call the numbers on your screen and share with us, you know, what your thoughts are on these uh, stories. Any of them that, you know, gets your attention. Um, father and son and one other die in Kano trying to retrieve phone from a latrine. Wow. What? Pergamon plans to peg varsity entry age at 18. And after 16 years, um, airspace agency to raise navigation charges. These are the big stories on the Daily Trust once again. But I think the most, the, the most trending or the biggest story in Nigeria today has to be the conversation with regards to state policing as well for as or against. And if you're for, what are your, you know, your reasons why you're for it? If you're against it, what are your reasons? Um, Abdul Karim saying that we need to match office. When? I mean, when, when will Nigeria, in 2024, we're still not mature. When will Nigeria be mature enough to take decisions that are best for itself, you know, as a country? How many more years of immaturity does Nigeria have how many more years is Nigeria going to be a toddler, you know, wearing, wearing a, a napkin and running around the place? I mean, we need to at least start doing some things. So, I mean, if we're going to keep waiting and waiting and waiting for us to mature, let's be mature enough in our democracy and mature enough, you know, with our, our, ourselves as a society before we can then allow for state police. When do you think that is ever going to happen? 
because it doesn't seem likely if we no, still have the, the current right type of the types of national assemblies that we've had back to back in the last couple of years that do nothing to checkmate the excesses of government. We have on the state houses of assembly uh, level that do also absolutely nothing to checkmate the excesses of government. Where government, a governor can wake up one day and because he's having issues with the house of assembly, goes to bulldoze the house of assembly complex. <laughs> that, that's the reality of the but country that we are what in. What has really been done about that? Exactly. That's how we've forgotten about the fact that Tamara e went and demolished exactly. the vast house of assembly complex. And so when then do we think we would ever be mature enough to say, okay, we need, you know, police. And, and I mean, when you hear of a thing like that, then you can imagine what a governor like that would have done if he had the full control of his state police under him. He wouldn't just bulldoze the house of assembly. People will be, you will see people's fathers doing frog jump, you know, in the middle of, uh, of uh, the road or in the market. When you talk about that frog jump, you know what it, <laughs> what it reminds me of? About the, the military era, that's what no, it reminds me of. No, even today, oh. NYSC, oh, when okay. you go into the camp and from the gates, they are making you carry your box. <laughs> and I, I don't even understand the concept of that one, but that's a conversation yeah. for another day. The, the point is, I understand everyone's fears, yes. but are we going to continue to hold back because of where? Afraid. And it's important oh. that we talk about the fears and then so that we can find systems and structures to checkmate these fears exactly. from happening. Checkmate the And that's powers. what they should be doing. Exactly. If it is not just amending the constitution, you know, for the, uh, to allow for state police, but also amend the constitution to checkmate the excesses or possible excesses of governors and who are going to be in charge. If it is to checkmate, you know, uh, or give more powers to state houses of assembly. Yes. These are things that we must, you know, start to think about. These are the things we indeed must talk and think about. Uh, let's look at one more paper this morning and see what the front page is. a Guardian newspaper. On front page of the Guardian, recapitalization. Insurers, banks compete for scarce uh, funds under new NIACOM. Uh, that's what the big story says. Government considers 18 as minimum age for admission seekers. I don't understand. What kind of admission are we talking about here? Are we talking about university admission? Do I have to wait until I'm 18? If I finish school at the age of 14 or 15, so I'm going to sit down at home for three years doing nothing because I have to turn 18? Then when I finish school at 22, the jobs I'm applying for will tell me that they need five-year experience. Anyway, we'll come back to talk about that. Um, federal government plans regulatory intervention as fiber repairs cost telcos 27 billion naira. Federal governments to resell this coast on the banks Amcon in three months. Cooking gas price spikes further as Nigerians struggle with food inflation. We deserve better than this. Nigerians certainly deserve better than this. Controversy trails reverse politics as lawmakers override Fubara's assent past local government amendment bill. Uh, we also have here terrorist skill 15 abduct married women in Katsina. There we go. IGP counter Stinubu says Nigeria not mature or ready for state police. Right. And that's all that we have this morning on the Guardian right. newspaper. Yemi Saka is joining us uh, this morning to, of course, you know, share his thoughts on some of these stories. Uh, good morning, Mr. Saka. Um, uh, can, you, can you hear us clearly? Yeah, Krista, I can hear you. All right, br brilliant. Um, welcome. Kindly sh um, go ahead. I, I would like that we start, of course, to talk about these um back and forth that we're having with, with regard to state policing former president Gulag jonathan says it is long overdue but of course the inspector general of police doesn't agree with him says that you know there still needs to be certain things put in place before we can you know go full force with state policing what what are your thoughts for me it's um uh, it's um it's hypocritical if anybody in this president's administration's current administration believes um we are not right for state police. We remember um, President Bola met to while in opposition, even as a state governor, then as the national leader of the APC, or as always been clamoring for state police. So it, um, if it's um, his, his agenda, it's like they cannot call it his pet project so, to see state police happen in Nigeria. We can remember, if you, we can only collect um, that it was the one in a bit of kind of carve out or fashion out his own state police was when it came up with RRS. So uh, even the IGP is coming out to be uh, singing a discordant song uh, uh, which is against uh, which is principle, it's actually wrong. You always have to be in tone in line with what your principle says. You cannot publicly disagree with your principle. So um, and for those that are saying or probably want to say 
President Goodluck, the former President Goodluck Jonathan should have done this in his, um, in his administration. Well, PDP as a party never believed in state police. PDP never promised state police. Yes, well, it's a, it's a conversation. Yes, it's an ongoing conversation since 1999. And for those that believe so much in state police, they are now in power, they are now you know, responsible, they have the control of the National Assembly. You probably would expect the constitutional um, issues or matters or probably the constitutional powers that that, um, that would need to enact a state police would be, would be an easy task to, to achieve under this administration. So, state police is, we write for state police. I don't know what the IGP is saying. I don't know from which perspective it's saying it from, but that will give us an, an increased and enlarged police force. If it's saying we don't have the resources to sustain, arm, equip, and, you know, retain, train and retrain um, state police formations across the country, it might not be far from the trip, but you probably would just, you know, you, can, you, won't be, you won't bite more than what you can chew. The Lagos state can decide it wants to, it want to, it wants to have, um, let's say, a police with uh, two, 200,000 standing force of men. Zafar, so you just say, okay, they want 10,000 because of the economic realities on ground. And, you know, it, it, it makes crime detection, crime prevention, and even prosecution faster. Because I cannot come from Agege, grew up in Agege, joined the police force of Lagos State, and the crime happens in Agege, and I cannot, I will not know where to go to, who to talk to, or who to apprehend. But is there sense in the complaint or in the perspective that he's raised? that uh, the state governors may be, be end up using this as an opportunity to manipulate uh, the police for their own selfish interests. Is that a good enough um, excuse? Well, that, that's a, that defense or argument is silly, part of my French, because even the, we've asked successive commander-in-chiefs or uh, commander yeah, that have um, abused the federal police. There was a CP in Bull that went against the governor of State during President Goodluck Jonathan. We all know how the IGP under uh, President Mamadou Buhari, how the police was um, was manipulated, you know, just to satisfy the ego of former President Mamadou Buhari. How a robbery case in Ofa was turned to a political event and they wanted to go paint the former senior president Bukola Saraki. So it's um it's human nature to want to make things work to your advantage, especially when you're in power, when you're in control. It doesn't make sense. The the what about Heineck? Has been controlling Heineck. Has Heineck given us a good a good uh, a fair credible election since 1999? Oh. What about the Nigerian Nigeria military? We saw how the military will go with full might in other president, other former president Mamadou Buhari in some in some parts of the country, and it comes to gain after the bandits and headsmen. They go after them with kid gloves and come up with silly excuse that they didn't know that they were that armed or fully armed. So that's it doesn't that argument doesn't hold water. You the we just we'll just come up with laws that reduce the control or interference of executive either at the federal level or the state level with policing in states at the federal level. And that solves it. All right, so talk you know, a little bit more about you know the types of you know maybe laws, adjustment to state level uh, laws that will make this you know seemingly um, achievable, viable plan. Um, what adjustments need to, be, need to be made, you know, at the federal and state level, um, so that we can have a workable plan for state police? Um, that Nigerians, of course, you know. Will get. I think for I think we need to just dismantle the um, the police act. Once we dismantle the police act, to have to um, acknowledge and accept that there will be state police and there will be you know controlled by the state government. State government, that's a first step in the right direction. Then we should probably, but then we need to take away the appointment of um, the police chief, who happens to maybe in state now, we know as commissioners, maybe from the state governors, maybe you know, make the, the police service commission um, a car, like a power startup, where for you to become the head of the police service commission, you should have worked there for a number of years, and then the recruitment process should not be like in, you know the average civil service recruitment with that you probably will see people or you know, see a police that will be independent and it's the ps um, the state police service commission now this is me now being futuristic 
that looks across, I will now look across the state um, command and choose who, be, who should be the state coming, the, the commission of police in the state. Then forward it to, to the judiciary in the state at the state level and they get ratified and, it and the person becomes a CP. With the open food, they were waiting for the assent of the governor. I think with that, we once the laws are there, people can even with tight laws, people find a way to circumvent laws, applications of laws, interpretations of laws. But if the laws are there, stringent enough, we probably get it right with time. Um Okay, now let's let's uh, move to another story. These are some of the front page of the newspapers of the Guardian newspaper. Um, we've talked about IGP countering Tinubu saying Nigeria not mature and ready for state police, and you've talked extensively on that. Uh, terrorists kill 15 abduct married women in Katsina. That's really sad. The reality that Nigerians have to live with. Government considers 18 as minimum age for admission seekers. I don't understand the logic behind this. Maybe I'll bring you in to share your thoughts on that. Uh, on that story, as well as cooking gas price spikes further as Nigerians struggle with food um, uh, yeah, inflation. So let's talk about the minimum age for admission seekers. 18, do you maybe understand what the logic behind that is? And do you agree with it? I didn't get that. Government considering 18 as minimum age for admission seekers. Minimum age? Yeah. For university admission. No, I... I I, I don't know. Sometimes we we so fond in majoring in minors. I I don't know how you probably want to put a bar restriction on how people grow intellectually. They are slow learners. They are fast learners. That your kids are so not bright or intelligent enough, maybe because of your DNA, you probably get into the university at the age of 18, 19, 20, 22. Doesn't mean people with kids that are intellectually smart enough because of their DNA that could smash their records and you know smash the exams and come out with flying colors won't get into school. It's I don't know. It's even an an infringement for me. My personal opinion an infraction of the fundamental man right. You cannot tell us to grow at. We should all grow at a certain pace. If I want to finish up with my education at the age of twenty two, and I have rightfully meritoriously without you know cutting corners let me be let me have my way i shouldn't just you can't drag me down because you have some dollars in in in, in your in your in your household or your location or your state or anything and sometimes some some policies are not well thought it might just it might just be big i think our our policy makers and decision makers oftentimes come out to public domain and propose policies are based on conversations or private discussions they have in their bedroom or in, at a family meeting. Because sometimes you just say something that you want, you can you ask yourself, where is this coming from? Yeah, I mean... I mean you... that kids are smarter. I, I can tell you that my nephew is smarter than I am at his age, when I was when I was at that age. So what we now want to now be out, out of jealousy Envy now slowing down. I would not want to do that. Yeah. Bear in mind that we still have, you know, a lot of um, issues with the, you know, quality of education in certain parts of the country, you know, where the cutoff marks, you know, are, are extremely poor, you know, just to accommodate, you know, those those uh, students, those pupils. Um, Mr. Kat, thank you so much for stopping by. We enjoy your perspective always. Yeah. We would like to see, uh, see you again. Well, my apologies for joining you guys late. Um, device could be, you know, yeah, more reliable the as the it's raining, weather. And that's typically what happens when it rains in uh, Nigeria. No, thanks. All right. Thank you. Now, still talking about security, the Inspector General of Police, uh, Kaya De Betoku, has uh, registered strong opposition to the proposal for the establishment of state controlled police forces. During a national dialogue on state police held in Abuja on Monday, Egberto cited a range of challenges and potential risks while articulating the leadership position of the Nigerian police force, as certain that the country is not yet prepared for such a transition. In the midst of bitter discussions across the nation on the division of law enforcement among state governments and the decentralization of police, the head of the police department took this firm stance on the controversial in light of these 
discussion, the IGP bemoans the lack of operational resources and manpower that are necessary for efficient law enforcement. Which of whose position marks the turning point in Nigeria's political search for a strong and efficient police by providing a focal point for discussion and decision making. And uh, that's the update that we have with you. We'll go on a very short break. And when we come back, we're heading to social media to see what Nigerians are saying on some of the biggest stories. Of course, state policing being one of them. In recent years, the clamor for the establishment of state police has drawn diverse arguments, with some for and others against the proposal. While the escalating insecurity situation in the country calls for urgent action, Nigeria's House of Representatives, after passing the bill for the second reading, has convened a national dialogue to get recommendations and inputs from stakeholders to finding lasting solutions. Let me state categorically that the House and indeed the National Assembly does not have a fixed position on this matter. Our role is to facilitate a dialogue and generate consensus. When I set up the 2014 National Dialogue, but in that period, we have a lot of challenges in the country. People were agitating so many areas. But when we set up that dialogue, one thing that the whole almost 500 delegates agreed without much ado was the issue of state police. Now, just from our president, good luck, Jonathan, and the former head of state, Abdul Salami Abubakar, while sharing their experiences, urged the consideration of inputs from traditional rulers and the consideration of border guards and coastal guards into the bill. If a stranger enters a village within hours, the village head knows about that stranger, and through their means of communication, the emir is aware. The National Assembly, while you are debating or uh, conducting a public hearing on the state police, these issues of national border force must be considered. On the issue of state police, it is the submission of the leadership of the Nigerian police force that Nigeria is yet to mature and ready for the establishment of state control police. President Bola Tinubu, who was represented by his vice, pledged the commitment of the executive to implement the legislation when passed. The insights we gain will inform our administration's approach to supporting legislation that not only enhances the capacity of our police force, but also strengthens the bonds of trust between law enforcement and the public. The discussion for the abduction of state policing has always courted controversies. Stakeholders here are calling on Nigeria's National Assembly to give more attention to issues bordering on right of abuse of citizens, financing of the police, and modalities for their recruitment. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. And the conversations continue. Um, Idonk Joseph with that one. We have joining us Evan Sufele, he's a constitutional lawyer, uh, to, of course, you know, x ray just a little bit on these issues. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Good to have you. Um, so, I mean, going straight to it, are you for or against? And whose argument, you know, do you, uh, you know, maybe support here? I'm for state police. Uh, it is important that um, looking at the security situation of the country, um, even before the case got this worse, just like uh, former President Bullock Jonathan alluded just now, even before, as at that time, um, the security situation in Nigeria was not this bad, but a majority of the people who conveyed them were agreed that state police is important. Important because Nigeria is a vast country and it has a lot of ungoverned space. The, those ungoverned space are uh, made so because of the centralization of security. All over the world, uh, if you centralize security, you are going to have lapses in uh, a lot of areas. And I think this uh, argument, uh, uh, we cannot um, say it enough, that the people who own their communities understand the terrain better than 
whoever you are bringing to that place as a policeman from different part of the country. Now, why don't you create, it's not even just uh, state police we need. You also need local government police. That's the truth. Uh, that is how it is in civilized countries, so that you are able to um, fight crime effectively. At every corner, you must have the eyes of the police to govern and to, uh, you know, um, keep uh, criminals away in civil society. All right. Um, There's so no point. Yeah, just because of, because of time, I'm trying to throw as many of them as possible uh, to you. Um, there's those who say that if governors have control of, you know, a full police force under them, that they will misuse it. They already have thugs, you know, that they, of course, you know, send to do their dirty work, you know, and it will be dangerous to have a governor handle a whole police force. Is that a concern that you also have? And, you know, is this also showing the complete failure of the State Houses of Assembly um, and, of course, you know, how Nigeria has been run for a while? Well, um, that, that fear is there. The possibility of that is there, given the way our politicians behave over time. Everyone uh, look at city State Houses of Assembly that are even autonomous. Uh, uh, by the doctrine of separation of power, have been many, many of these uh, state house assembly have been uh, colonized by governors. But for the police, um, we have to design uh, that uh, part in such a way that the police, state police, will not be will not be answerable to the governors. The state police should be made to be answerable to the people. Okay, and uh, the uh, the leader of the police in the state should not be answerable to the governor. That is it. it because if if you have that, then what you are you are you are creating is a situation where the police will begin to dictate everything that, uh, and they will turn that state police to some kind of uh, 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 organization that will be doing their bidding. Yeah. So All it should right. be security driven. It should be it should be state driven. Uh, possibly. If the police should be answerable to the people, perhaps uh, they should uh, uh, upscale the traditional ruler, upscale them, and then um, give them the capacity to be able to work together with the police at the state level. That's my suggestion. If, yeah. if that is the fear, otherwise it could go ahead. Uh, even the federal police, police that we have as currently constituted, they are also being used by governors largely. Okay, uh -huh. so. We cannot say because uh, of the fear of governors, then we will allow our society to deteriorate security-wise. We we'll allow uh, kidnapping to keep uh, unbated and all the sundry crimes that is in our community today. Uh, we cannot afford to, to live that way. Uh, there's a way in which you can also restrain the governors of the state from uh, turning the police force into um, whatever it is the, the fears are. So yeah. we, we, we must go there. All right, Mr. Feli. Um, you know, it's a conversation, you know, a lot of Nigerians are going to have um, for the next couple of days, and we, we would like to see where these discussions end with the Tidimbo administration. Thanks very much for stopping by. Love to speak with you again. You're welcome. Thank right. you. Now, of course, we've had guests share their thoughts on state police. We've also shared with you what the former president said, the IGP also said. But let's tell you what Nigerians are saying. This is the point where we talk about what Niger Nigerians are saying about some of the biggest stories around the country. Now, yesterday there was division as we looked at the uh, conversation about state policing. What we did see is that there was a one-day national dialogue on state policing and there were mixed reactions surrounding whether or whether we sh whether or whether we shouldn't have the state police. Of course, the IGP, Ebetokun, through his representative, shared the sentiments against state policing, saying that Nigeria is not yet mature for state policing. Let's share with you what some Nigerians are saying regarding this. Now, this is from Pat Smart on X. He says, there is apprehension about governors using state police. Since we know, let the focus on public discourse be on the mitigation measures. Federal FGN is not holy. It, is, it also abuses its powers in many ways. Let this be about good governance, not the fear of FGN losing some power to state. Uh, some other tweets have also shared sentiments. This one is by Bade Kale Wasu Adirem. He says, they will surely abuse it. We all saw what the Kogi State Governor did, preventing the EFCC from doing their job. Now, imagine him having his own police. Hmm. 
There have been more reactions uh, to this story, and let's see the next tweet. This is from Patriotic Nigeria, an interesting name. What difference does it make? Governors are already abusing federal police. We need state police. Each state will employ its people and have their own uniforms. Policing should be local, not someone from Borono pol policing in Rivers, and vice versa. Remove police barracks, too. We'll take another tweet. This one says, it doesn't matter what approach we take. The main problem of our government structure is that it's reliant on people and not systems. Governors should not be able to abuse a system that puts deterrence in place to ensure its efficiency. We can't get anything right if we don't fix this. I believe we have two more tweets um, in this regard. And uh, let's look at other tweets. Chief Uwachine Melu says, I have shared same sentiments with Prof. We are not ripe for state policing. Some unscrupulous politicians will weaponize it against the opposition. Imagine Hopu Zodima, Soludo, and the rest being in charge of state police. Madoago. <laughs> He was replying to a tweet. I disagree on this. The Federal Police Office should be set up nationwide to moderate the abuse of local police powers. Likewise, relieving the contesting incumbent governor from chief security officer of state using an interim till election is over and indigenous police is careful. Uh, this is Austin Aluge Dumbiri. And these are some of the perspectives we've seen regarding state police. And I would like to ask you, what side of the divide are you on? Should Nigeria employ conversations about state police, or do you agree with the IGP when he says they were not mature enough? Some of the arguments we've seen against this as well would be that some of the institutions that are under the gov governance of the state have not even fared well. So what are the guarantees that bringing state police would ensure that we you know, win the fight or make... Uh, uh, progress against uh, the fight against insecurity. Now let's move away from there and talk about something that affects all Nigerians. Petrol queues and fuel scarcity have resurfaced in different parts in Nigeria. Earlier on, on the show, we talked about, we shared the package that showed the fuel queue in Abuja, but it would seem that it spread to different parts of the country. Now let's share with you what Nigerians are saying about it and how exactly it's affected them. Our first tweet is from Haile Husseini. He says, issue of fuel scarcity is back and our children have to go to school. The next tweet is from Mafe Chokpami, and I'm sure that a number of Nigerians can relate to this. He says, there's no electricity. There's always looming fuel scarcity. There's massive heat everywhere. Yesterday, I almost ran mad because of the heat. I can't work out. I can't work. I can't do anything because I'm always dripping with sweat due to the AC not running. And this is the reality of a number of Nigerians. It's affecting productivity. Suleiman Takar says, fuel subsidy has been removed. Dollar is said to be crashing. Why is there fuel scarcity? What is it again? Kenny James is the next tweet, says, please, kindly look into the situation in Adoikiti. So you would see that it's not just in Abuja. Petrol is currently sold at 700 naira per liter. The marketer intentionally created artificial scarcity by hoarding fuel across the town, forcing buyers to buy in panic. I'm sure there is no petrol scarcity in Nigeria right now. There is. Chubado is the next tweet, says, what's the reason behind the fuel scarcity in Yola? And the next tweet we have is from Rosé Akai. Uh, Rosé Akai says, there's fuel scarcity in Uyo. What's the reason for this? Now, there was uh, information about uh, a, a drama between the marketers and the security agencies. And Ipman did put out a letter to that effect. Let's look at the letter by Ipman. And this letter sort of explained what happened. What, uh, uh, happened and had put out a directive. It's a notice of withdrawal of service. In line with the stakeholders' decision taken recently for infractions into our businesses caused by the activities of Natural Oil and Gas Suppliers Association, NOGASA, where members' products were impounded on the road and extorted. You are by this notice required to close your stations and outlets from the public as follows. Now, this began from Monday the 22nd of April 2024 and the duration was 6 a.m. on Monday till further notice. There was also a fine of non-compliance for 300,000. In reaction to this, uh, there's a press statement uh, from the government in Uyo State and uh, let's take a look at the press statement sort of addressing the situation. And uh, in this press statement, we, we, we saw that there had been moves that, that had been made, there are talks that had been made to ensure that uh, they sort of resolve the issue between Ipman and Nogasa. Uh, we will share that much later, maybe uh, uh, tomorrow we don't have that, but let's share a final tweet. Okay, yeah, this is a press statement. It says, in response to the fuel scarcity which began this morning arising from a misunderstanding between product marketers and some security agencies, the Aquaibom State Governor, His Excellency Pastor Umoeno, is currently meeting with different groups within the petroleum marketing sector 
with a view to finding solutions to the immediate and remote causes of this problem. And the final tweet is from Pastor Umar Eno himself, who shares the work that is being done regarding um, ensuring that the fuel scarcity in Akwa Ibom comes to an end. So we, we look for, forward to ensuring that this is replicated across the country. Nigerians are going through a rough patch. We can't be paying exorbitant prices for fuel and yet not have access to the prices, uh, to the products. Diesel, on the other hand, is also increasing. Anyway, share your thoughts with us as we'll be taking more of your thoughts and your tweets on X at News Central TV. Until we come your way again, thank you very much for joining us. I am Olive Emodi.